Step One Academy. I'm Dr. C. Please join me in this musical journey. Let's go! Hello, everybody. I'm here today with Kristen Spirino, my dear colleague from Savannah Philharmonic. Uh, she is uh, now embarking on a new adventure, uh, teaching applied clarinet lessons and a full studio of clarinet students at Georgia Southern and Statesboro. Uh, till now, she was an uh, education and outreach coordinator for Savannah Philharmonic, has been playing a principal clarinet for how long? Eight years? Nine? Uh, I moved from second clarinet to principal clarinet about four years ago, but I've been with the organization for nine years. Okay, so that, that's, that's, I think, where nine is coming to my mind. Yes. But, yes. but anyhow, welcome. Thank you. It's good and to be here. I think uh, I could not find a better person to tell us uh, in the simplest way, uh, you know, everything we can learn about clarinet and maybe spark some, some imagination about the instrument and you know maybe we'll, somebody is going to pick it up and start playing because they they heard some some funny uh, facts things about the clarinet today okay so how did you start playing well back in new jersey where i'm from we start music in the third grade but they only offer string instruments so i was so enthusiastic to play an instrument that i actually chose violin and from starting violin I knew that I loved music, but the violin didn't love me. I was pretty bad at it, actually. <laughs> really, really bad. To the point where my bridge snapped in my first concert, and I just held up my violin, and after that concert, I quit. So <laughs> my parents said, I don't think you're going to be a musician. So then when I came to them going into fourth grade, when winds and brass were offered, I said, Mom, I want to play the clarinet. And she's like, oh, boy, here we go. But in her words... She said the first couple notes of clarinet were better than a whole year on violin. So <laughs> <laughs> from move, my movement from violin to clarinet was a smooth transition, and I just loved it. So um, I chose clarinet, and this is a little bit embarrassing. When I was in fourth grade, I was kind of a large girl, pretty hefty, <laughs> and I thought it looked like licorice. So that's my only logic from playing the clarinet, but um, <laughs> it was a good match. So um, I truly do play the licorice stick, uh, as they call uh -huh. it. It's nick nickname. <laughs> um, but that's, it stuck. I shrunk, awesome. but, but the clarinet stuck with me. <laughs> so, and, and then at what point you, you kind of realized, oh my God, this is, this is actually what I would like to do for, for, for living, or I would like to make a career out of this. I think once I hit high school um, and really started to be exposed to a copious amount of uh, band repertoire and learning about orchestras and playing in the high school orchestra um, really got me into thinking that this is something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was very fortunate enough to go to a high school called J.P. Stevens in New Jersey that I think has one of the best band programs and some of the best teachers. And from their support and from them always pushing us to um, excel at our crafts, that really inspired me to go into music. When you decided, you know, I guess mid-high school that, that you want to go to to music conservatory or, or school of music, mm -hmm. uh, how did that, you know, choice kind of happen? Did you, did you know where you're going to go? I knew I wanted to go to a conservatory. Um, I just didn't know which one. So it took visiting different ones to get a feel. I ultimately ended up at the Peabody Conservatory for my undergrad and I had such a great time. I, I have to 
attribute my mom most of all to this, um, my dad too, but my mom especially because she sacrificed a good chunk of her retirement to send me to Peabody because it's not cheap. And with scholarship, I was able to um, make this happen. But once I walked into Peabody and saw the grand staircase and, and um, the facilities and met the teacher who was Stephen Barta at the time, uh, I knew that's where I wanted to go. Similarly with uh, grad work in Cincinnati College Conservatory, Richie Hawley was just incredible and he changed my life. So really going to these schools and meeting these professors and and seeing the atmosphere uh, was really a big part of my decision making process on where to go to solidify my craft. How do you think, because Baltimore is where Peabody is, right, and uh, in Cincinnati, uh, both have amazing cultural scene and, and, and very vibrant. One of, you know, two greatest American orchestras are in, in you know, residence in Baltimore and in, in, in Cincinnati. So yes. how is that, you know, that, that atmosphere and surrounding was it an impact on your learning? So to be exposed to the great orchestra works week after week and seeing my own teachers play them with, with such finesse and such beauty, it, really fueled the fire for me to work as hard as I could to, you know, I'll never truly be Richie Hawley, but, you know, to really try to follow in their footsteps and um, be the best player I can be. And Stephen Barta actually at Peabody, he was the principal of the Baltimore Symphony for 39 years. And his first job was the Savannah Symphony. Oh, so even wow. though... Even though we're the Philharmonic, but the point is I'm essentially sitting in his chair, so to speak. <laughs> um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, so really seeing them play week after week and just having the privilege of being able to get student tickets for like $10 and see these wonderful performances was, it was such a privilege and such um, something that I think not enough people take advantage of. Yeah. I remember all of my concerts you know, from those early years that I, that I attended. Uh, you know, of orchestras playing, and I and I'm sure that 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 in many ways shaped my, uh, you know, taste or my 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 you know love for for uh, orchestral music and and just for classical music in general. And then seeing you know solace, world renowned you know players that that would come and play with those orchestras, you know, it is just an experience that 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 is you know beyond uh, anybody's expectations. When you finished conservatory and thinking about, am I gonna go into performance or I'm gonna go into teaching? And have you ever made that decision? When I was first going to Peabody, um, I clearly wanted to be a performer. That's what I wanted to do. And my dad was always the voice of reason. And he said, well, you're not going to Peabody unless you get an education degree as well. And I was so upset um, at first, but then going through the program and it really didn't take me to a until after graduation, after I finished the program to say, I actually really like teaching. So then pursuing my master's was performance and also artist diploma. I started to say, well, I could do either one. Uh, so, Really, it's been 50-50 for me. I equally love performing and teaching just evenly. You know, it, it was something that not only can I show the next generation of musicians on stage what we're supposed to be doing orchestrally and, and representing the great orchestral works, but teaching at not only the university level, but from beginner to grad student, um, shaping these young musicians' lives. And that's so important to me. So I'm privileged to be able to have the best of both worlds. You are obviously the perfect person to be asked to present a clarinet. So this is the clarinet. And as I said before, the nickname is the licorice stick because it looks like black licorice. And the clarinet is a part of a musical family called the Woodwind family. And if you really take a look at that word and dissect it, wood is what most professional clarinets are made out of. They're made out of wood. So that's the first half of the name. And then wind is how we actually produce a sound on our instruments. So the clarinet is made up of five pieces independently and has holes that you have to cover as you're producing the air to go through the instrument. And you're probably thinking, well, there's probably just a mouthpiece that you have to play 
to get that sound on the clarinet. Yes and no. There is a mouthpiece, but the way that the sound is really produced on the clarinet is from the air making something vibrate back and forth, and that is called a reed, which looks like this. And with that reed, you actually have to fasten it to the mouthpiece, like so. Mm -hmm. So it's aligned with that mouthpiece. And then you have this little contraption called a ligature that you have to stabilize the reed on that mouthpiece. And you tighten it with screws. Now, every professional's had that heart attack moment where their ligature breaks on stage. It has to happen to you at least once. And then, you know, <laughs> you usually just, you know, put your hair down no matter how it looks and sacrifice a hair tie and make it work <laughs> for the concert. We've been there as female awesome. clarinetists. Um, but once you do that, that reed works with the air that you're putting through the mouthpiece to vibrate back and forth and produce a sound. And I can actually feel on the bottom of my lip that reed vibrating. And the reed actually, I don't think a lot of people know this, you know how our skin has pores? Yes. The, reed has, the reed has pores. So if a reed is not working right, it's probably just clogged with um, water, as we call it, waterlogged or other stuff that I really don't want to know about that my students <laughs> put through their clarinet that get stuck in that those pores. I don't want to know. But um, they're finicky little pieces of wood, but we love them because it makes the clarinet work. That's awesome. Now, I know in our previous episodes, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, oboe and English horn. Yes. And uh, we have not had a chance to, to, to present the bassoon, but uh, those instruments uh, have actually a double reed, right? So they have two uh, yes. reeds that are, that are actually stuck you know, together uh, or wrapped around uh, together. But you have one reed, right? And it, right. And it, and it vibrates against uh, the mouthpiece. It vibrates, um, yeah, essentially, yes. So it's strapped to the mouthpiece and the air makes it vibrate with that mouthpiece that's holding the reed and the sound is produced. If you're talking about, you know, mouthpieces for the trumpet and for the brass and all, I guess you guys have, you know, a passion for different mouthpieces as well, because that's like really important piece of equipment that, that, so it, it is actually customizable, you know, personal. Actually, a lot of different parts of the clarinet, which I'll show you, can be customizable. Uh, the mouthpiece is, I would say, the most important because not only does it have to feel good and you have to be able to control what you're doing, but um, there's, there's a certain sound concept that some of us seek. So you have to make sure that the mouthpiece that you choose is accomplishing that sound concept. So if you like a bright sound, you have, might choose one mouthpiece combination. If you like a more dark and centered sound, you might choose another one. Another part um, of the sequence here is uh, this part right here, which is called the barrel. And the barrel, it really makes a difference as far as intonation on the clarinet and projection. So um, one of my um, endorsements is from Rice Clare Networks and he produces different kinds of barrels and this is actually called Delrin and I've found to really get my sound to the back of the hall it really helps with projection. I'm learning every episode I learned something that I never heard of before and I thought the barrels are also part of the clarinet itself I mean they come together with the rest of the clarinet but now I'm you know learning that they actually are a separate piece that can be customized to to a player exactly and so can the bell i oh. have a standard bell um i haven't moved off of it yet but uh a lot of bells also help with intonation and sound concepts as well so it's how much do you want to essentially um dress up the clarinet so to say <laughs> I, I i swear it's like barbie's um wardrobe <laughs> you yeah, can that's swap that's as much that's of it as you want yeah, you, you, you actually have only two pieces in the middle that are, that are sort of, you know, there all the time, but then everything else is, is interchangeable. Exactly. You know, you also have to um, find a clarinet maker that you like. I'm also an artist for Buffet Crampon, and I love their clarinets, but there's various clarinet makers um, that also help establish your sound. 
The standard one that you're seeing right here is called the B-flat clarinet. That's what's used mostly in band playing and a lot of orchestral playing. Um, a clarinet that's a little bit longer, like slightly longer, maybe about an inch longer, maybe not even, I'm not good at math, is an A clarinet and that produces a little bit of a darker sound. Um, there's another clarinet that's a little bit smaller than the B-flat clarinet called the C clarinet and that was used in early classical music. Um, well, some composers didn't learn their lesson and they still wrote for it later on, but um, that's a little bit of a brighter sound. Um, on the small end, we have something called an E-flat clarinet, and it is very high and very squeaky, and if you want to really uh, make the audience <laughs> jump, we use that that's, one. That, that's the one to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to scare somebody, play the E-flat. And then the <laughs> biggest one is called the bass clarinet, which produces this very low um, sound, and it's used for a lot of accompanimental figures, um, but there's also a lot of solo uh, solos in the orchestral repertoire written for that bass clarinet. So we have a lot of them, a lot of clarinets. I think, uh, I think that bass clarinet probably people will recognize most by uh, going to Nutcracker and listening to Nutcracker. Oh, yes. There are so many numbers in that in that ballet that actually feature bass clarinet. Uh, this bass clarinet has to do anything with the with saxophone. The mouthpiece on the saxophone. Is, is very similar to the clarinet mouthpiece. It, it uses one reed and it has the same shape. So the bass clarinet mouthpiece is just a little bit bigger, uh, uh, just like the E-flat clarinet mouthpiece is a little bit smaller. I mean, clarinet and saxophone are, are kind of similar in the, in the sound production, in the way that you are you know, holding your mouth and, and placing it around the, the mouthpiece. There are subtle differences, but mm -hmm. the core concept of mouthpiece, single reed, vibration of the reed held with ligature is similar. The flute is closer with the fingerings of the saxophone, actually, which is interesting. There's a lot of clarinets that also double and play saxophone. I did it for a little bit in high school. Can you uh, just show us real quick uh, something very simple and, 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 and just, uh, you know, play it on the clarinet uh, that you think would uh, represent the instrument so even just a standard scale is going to represent the instrument as far as its range. It can go from, you know, quite low to pretty yeah. high. So if we just start with a standard scale, it can actually go three octaves. Oh. So it's oh. a pretty, pretty high range, um, and that's not even the highest. I'm going to spare you. The really high notes because nobody wants to hear those but i tell my students you know sometimes they say oh no i squeaked you know that sounded bad i said well actually that's that's a very upper third octave so you are producing some sort of a note uh, thank you so much for this it's been such a pleasure thank you to buffet crampon and to rice clarinet works for uh endorsing me and um, supporting me and having me as one of your performing artists and also to the Savannah Philharmonic, Georgia Southern University, uh, Coastal Symphony and Augusta Symphony, which I um, frequent in the orchestras and a member of. Uh, so all wonderful organizations who um, I support heavily and it's good to see that our patrons support them as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope that you know this episode will give uh, our viewers a chance to to at least you know start learning about the clarinet thank you again and i hope i see you soon and we actually get into performance mode as, <laughs> as soon yes. as possible <laughs> yes absolutely and thank you for having me it's been a pleasure <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.